18,898 days, or 38 years and 19 days. That's how long Maurice Hastings was in prison for a crime that he did not commit. In 1983, he was wrongfully convicted of murder and rape, even though he had an alibi. The crowd cheered as the jury read the guilty verdict. Ultimately, after multiple appeals and appeals, the DA finally retested evidence from the crime scene and realized that it wasn't his. 13,898 days away from friends and family. 13,898 days locked away behind bars. Can you imagine what it felt like the day he got released? As he breathed air of freedom for the very first time and felt sunshine on his face, knowing that his name and the charge that he had been fully acquitted. You see, the prisoner had been set free. The Bible says to you and I that our sin enslaves us, shackling us with guilt and shame, and ultimately death. And I know that you feel the sin and darkness of our culture closing in. But the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ alone has the power to set us free. So as we pick up our narrative in the gospel or in the book of Acts, turn with me in your Bible to chapter 13. We're going to see here today that, that Paul and Barnabas, they're on their first missionary journey, and they are in the city of Poseidon, Antioch. And Paul has been invited to share a message in the synagogue on the Sabbath that day. And when we get to the climax of Paul's sermon, okay, it is that there is forgiveness, that there is freedom in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen? So I hope you're ready to jump in. Now, as we, uh, as we pick back up our, our narrative in the book of Acts, I, I want you to think through that Remember the church in, in Syrian Antioch had been praying. They had been praying and fasting, asking for, for God's direction. God, what do you want to do with us? And could you believe it? The Spirit said, take Paul and Barnabas, the, the two leaders, and send them out. Okay, up till that point, right, um, the, the gospel really only went because of persecution. And, and as people relocated, they told people. But here, for, for the first time, you have a missionary sent out, going intentionally. And as Chad began to walk us through last week, where, where's the first spot that they went? Cyprus. Because that's where Barnabas is from. And now we're going to pick up in that missionary journey out of Acts chapter 13. But before I read the text, this morning, we also get to take the Lord's Supper. And so in your heart and mind, as we move towards the freedom of God's grace, we're gonna move towards the Lord's Supper. If you, you should have got elements as you came in, if you did not, if you would lift up your hand and the deacons around will come and make sure that everyone got elements. 
so that you are prepared. And then in your hearts and in your minds, we do not want to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. This is a, an incredible privilege given to you who've been born again. To those, those of us that know Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. And it means so much, this remembrance, to remember his broken body and his shed blood. So listen as I read in Acts chapter 13, verses uh, 13 through 15, and then hold your spot there. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea uh, from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. But John, that's John Mark, he left them and returned to Jerusalem. But going on from Perga, they arrived at Poseidon, Antioch. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. Now, after the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, As we have gathered this Lord's Day, this Resurrection Sunday, as your people, people that you have set free in your grace, we pray right now in Jesus' name, Father, if there is anyone here that does not know you, that they would come to know the freedom of the grace of Jesus Christ. Would you make that happen? Would your Holy Spirit move in a powerful way? Additionally, Father, every one of us that do know you, God, we do confess how often we run back into bondage, back into sin, and we do not understand the extent of our freedom. And we pray that your spirit would again today allow us to see and understand that freedom in a whole new way. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. So John Mark has had enough. We're not told a specific reason, but what becomes clear later is that he deserted them. Now, as you piece together some of the things that Paul says later, and he talked about shipwreck, it's it's possible that going from Cyprus to Perga that they were shipwrecked. Whatever the reason is, as they gather up later, it was insufficient in order to abandon the mission. And so Paul and Barnabas and a team, it says here that uh, his companions will now travel into the providence of Galatia, ascending uh, the Taurus Mountains, climbing 3,600 feet in elevation. It's it's very rigorous terrain that they are about to walk. We, We will learn from Paul's letter to the Galatians that when he arrived, he was not in good health. Possibly, probably malaria. And the team may have fallen victim to bandits who preyed on travelers through this rugged terrain. Maybe that's why John Mark left. Maybe he knew, look, I I am not going there. Now the next, next major stop of note is the city of Poseidon, Antioch. Now this is not to be confused with their sending church, which is Another city called Antioch, but in Syria. So we call that Syrian Antioch and Poseidon Antioch. Now, Poseidon Antioch was a good-sized city, roughly 50,000 people. And uh, it's a really important one on the east-west travel route. Now, most notable is that they had a large Jewish population that had settled there. Uh, history records 2,000 families. And you got to understand, this is, this is far away from Jerusalem. And so here in Poseidon Antioch, they had a synagogue, and they had great influence in the city. 
There, there were a large number of Gentiles who had converted to Judaism. That's called a proselyte. And many more who were curious and, and would show up to the synagogue. Those are called God-fearers. And this is where Paul and Barnabas start. Okay? It became their initial pattern. They would come into a new city and they would start with the Jewish synagogue. Now, of course, this makes logical sense because you're going to go to a people that have a similar worldview and a similar culture. And on top of that, the Jews were expecting a Messiah. And Paul could go in and he could use the fact that he had been schooled under the very prestigious and well-known Pharisee Gamaliel, and he could gain their ear. He had a lot of clout. Oh, you, you studied under him? And so they would show up for synagogue on the Sabbath, and the scriptures would be read, and, and then it was very customary to invite someone, a guest, especially one of notable education and reputation, to give an exhortation to the people. So that's what happens here, and in verses 16 through 41, is a summary of the sermon that Paul gave. Now, as we walk through the book of Acts, there's going to be a number of sermons in in the text, and it, it would take a really long time if I broke down each sermon for you. Um, And so for our purposes, I'm, I'm going to quickly give you the highlights so that you understand how Paul's sermon is working. So most naturally, he stood up and he made a connection with them as a fellow Jew. You can see that in verses 17. He said, the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers. Our fathers. Okay? And then in verse 26, he calls them brethren and sons of Abraham's family. Okay? He, he's making those connections. Further, he begins and he walks through Jewish history, highlighting, you know, God has been faithful, even though along the way, we proved ourselves to be disobedient. And then he reminds them that we are a people of the promise, that God had promised through David a savior That a savior would come. And guess what? Now he has come and his name is Jesus. So remember, this is a decade after the cross and resurrection. And they are far from Jerusalem. And they may have only heard faint details about Jesus. And so Paul begins and he unfolds to them. They had heard of John the Baptist Okay, John the Baptist, why? Because there hadn't been a prophet in 400 years. And so he starts with them and he goes, listen, do you remember John the Baptist? Well, he said that there is one coming after him of whose sandals he is unworthy to even untie. And, and even though the Jewish leaders rejected Jesus, little did they know that they were actually fulfilling prophecy about the Messiah. And Paul quotes Psalm 2, Isaiah 55, and Psalm 16. Those two Psalms were written by David a thousand years prior. And Isaiah was written 700 years prior. And Paul shows them, did you know that the word of God had long predicted that the Messiah would suffer and that he would rise from the dead? And they were there that day to give witness, to let you know Jesus is that Messiah. And we know that he is the son of God and he has risen from the dead. And Paul's been building in this sermon all of that factual, important building information, but he's ultimately getting to this one spot. Verses 38 and 39. Therefore, right? Everything's been building to this. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, through this Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, 
everyone who believes is freed from all things, from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Do you know that Paul had no problems standing before a crowd that he had just met for the first time and declaring to them that everyone needs forgiveness before a holy God. Everyone needs forgiveness. Paul himself knew that he needed escape from the wrath of God. I too would tell you that I need escape from my guilt and shame. And so do you. Friend, do you fear God? Do you fear God? Guys, let's be honest. In our most sober moments, every one of us, we long to be made right with God, to be freed from our guilt and shame. And Paul had traveled months. He had endured sickness and and robbery in order to stand before them that day and proclaim, guys, I have good news for you that there is forgiveness in Jesus, that there is a way that you can be completely clean, forever clean in Jesus' name. Verse 39, through him, everyone who believes. Do you know it's a free gift? It's a free gift simply by faith is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. You see, what makes this such good news is that by faith you can be set free. Do you love that idea? Set free. Hey, do you want to be free from guilt and shame of your sin? Well, it's not through moral instruction, okay? It's not through religious ritual. The law of Moses cannot set you free. You see, what's what's woven in here, what's underlying is this idea that every one of us is enslaved, is enslaved to our sin. This, this, is what, this is a conversation Jesus had with the crowd in John chapter 8. They said, we're not slaves. We're sons of Abraham. We're free. He says, you know, you don't understand. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And no amount Okay, of, of moral instruction or, or religious practices can ever set you free. You say, but the law of Moses was God's moral instruction and God's religious practices. And it is full of truth and wisdom. But it cannot and it will not set you free from the guilt and shame of your sin. Doing religious things, lighting candles and praying, carrying beads, even faithfully attending church and reading your Bible, even fasting. What about joining a monastery or or a vow of, of celibacy? It cannot, will not set you free. In fact, those religious works will only add to the bondage of guilt or pride. Only Jesus can set you free. And he offers it as a free gift. And it's called God's grace. God's grace. Friend, have you ever experienced the freedom of God's grace, freedom that Jesus has accomplished for you what you could never accomplish on your own, and rest 
knowing that that freedom is forever. Forever. To be able to stand before a holy God clean forever. Have you personally found God's grace? And there's no reason to move on in this sermon. There's no reason. Did, did you know that you can write now? Think about what I'm saying. This, this truth is mind-blowing. You can experience God's grace, eternal freedom right now. By simply calling upon the name of Jesus. By simply by faith believing that he accomplished for you what you could never on your own. And accepting that free gift. God's grace. Friend, that's why we gather every Sunday. It's actually willingly out of freedom. Because we want to and we want to celebrate and we want to join and we want to encourage each other. And Paul ends his sermon. And in verse 42 and 43, they beg him, them, right, to come back. Come back and tell us more. Right? They are blown away by this idea of grace. You mean set free? Not through the law of Moses, I could be set free. Look at verse 43. It says they urge them to continue in the grace of God. That is very unusual language for a Jewish synagogue. They are blown away. They're saying, wow, grace, a free gift given to me? Yes, grace. And so as, as church ends that day, and all week long, do you know all anyone could talk about was grace? That, that, it, it, was, it was a mind, revolutionary idea. All they could talk about was God's grace. And, and they went and, and they told their friends and their neighbors, and they began to tell everyone. Now, you need to remember, right, that they have a good size of Greeks, proselytites, and God-fearers. And so look at what verse 44 says. The next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of God. Amen. Now, certainly this is a hyperbole because there's 50,000 people in the city. But Luke wants you to understand that a massive group showed up at the synagogue that next Sabbath day. They all showed up because they wanted to hear about grace. There is a way to be made right with God, and it's God's free gift. He can set me free. Now think about what it looks like for the whole city to show up. Because remember, it's overwhelmingly non-Jewish. Greeks and Romans, men and women, young and old, some educated, but more poor. And they all show up with a hopeful longing. Is there enough grace for me? Verse 45. But when the Jews, that's going to be the leaders, those who are in charge of the synagogue, when they saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and began to blasphemy. That means they began to lie and contradict. Said, that is not true. 
Now hold your eyes on this verse. Because I'm going to tell you what unfolds in the rest of the narrative. That is that Paul and Barnabas, they boldly stand up for the truth of the gospel. Right? They boldly stand up. Okay? And, and they turn from the Jewish synagogue to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles celebrate greatly. And then this group, okay, of, of Jewish leaders, they begin to institute uh, and instigate persecution. They, they go to influential leaders and they start having dinners and they start scheming. They start doing all of those things and they run Paul and Barnabas out of town, ultimately rejecting the gospel. But guys, what's so disheartening is why? Why? One week prior, they are filled with hope and wonder at this idea of grace. Grace. All week long, the Spirit of God began to stir in their hearts and in their minds through the gospel. They said, wow, God did promise through David a Messiah. In Isaiah 55, it does indicate Okay, that, that uh, God's servant would suffer, but then he would receive the promises from David. And Psalm 16, you know, David is dead. How come Psalm 16 says that God will not allow his holy one to undergo decay? That is talking about the Messiah dying but rising from the dead. And all week long, the Spirit of God is stirring in them, and their minds are racing towards this idea. Do you mean that God accomplished for me everything? And in regards to holiness and righteousness, in order to be able to stand before him, that God accomplished it all for me, and then offers it as a free gift through faith? And their minds are filled with that idea. And they are so near to salvation. They're right there. And they come back that next Sabbath day with hopeful wonder. Ready with anticipation. Is God's grace enough to save me? But when they look up and see that everyone else in the city is there. People that they don't particularly like. And certainly people that they know they are better than. And the sin of jealousy rises up in their heart. And they can no longer hear the gospel. They love the idea of grace whenever it was applied to themselves. As long as it's not for them. What a monstrous depiction for an unbelieving city that showed up for church that day because they too wanted to know, is that grace for me? And instead, they found a jealous, closed group of people. A young couple got married and they were on their way home from their honeymoon when a tractor trailer pulled, pulled out in front of them and, and, and the groom had to swerve the car and, and they crashed in the ditch on the side of the road and, and the groom was okay, but as he looked over into the passenger seat, he could see that his bride was bleeding profusely 
and that she needed to get immediate medical attention or she would die. And so he gets her out of the car and he picks her up and he looks up ahead and he sees a sign off just down the road in the distance, a doctor's office, Dr. Rufus Jones, medical practice. And he picks her up and he begins and he treks up the hill and, and he, he, gets on the, he gets up there and he knocks on the door. And an old man answers and he says, Dr. Jones, he says, well, yes. He says, it's my wife. She's bleeding. She's, she's dying. You've got to do something to help her. To which the doctor replies, I'm sorry, son, but I've got some bad news. I'm no longer practicing medicine. I've given away all my medical equipment and supplies. I have no medicine and no help here. I'm sorry. And he shuts the door. The groom, aghast, holding his wife, kicks on the door again, begins to pound it. The doctor comes back to the door and he says, son, I've already told you I'm sorry. I cannot help you. To which the groom looks and replies, Sir, if you are not in the business of helping, hurting people, then take down your sign. You see, there is a world of hurting people out there on the verge of eternal death. And the grace found in Jesus Christ is their only hope. And some of them are desperate enough even to show up for church on Sundays because they've been told Jesus is that hospital. He is that healer. And listen to me. Any church that is not in the business of helping hurting people, that is not a hospital, needs to take down their sign. There is no need for a sign, First Baptist Bernie, if this is not a place where hurting people are welcomed and find the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Beloved, I'm not trying to be heavy-handed. I am reminding us who we are. We are the church that Jesus died for. And God has placed us on this hilltop here in Bernie to, to be a place where people can come and find healing. They can find life. Amen. And it is my continual prayer as your pastor and the entire pastoral staff that the good news of Jesus Christ, the grace that you can find in his name will permeate this place, will permeate everything we do. Amen. Now what I love here about Acts 13, right? Paul, he's not having it, okay? He does not stop because, they, because the, the religious leaders, they get jealous, they kick them out of the synagogue and then they begin to persecute them and drive them out of town, okay? Paul knows this is God's plan. And God has ordained from the foundation of the world that this good news, it will go to the Gentiles and it will go to the ends of the earth. And look at verse 49 there. It says, and the gospel spread through the whole region. Through the whole region. You know what that means, right? Hundreds, thousands of people were set free. The chains of guilt and shame were broken. 
and the bondage of sin was shattered. This morning, we celebrate that. We celebrate that with the Lord's Supper. So turn with me now and and take out your elements and I want you to prepare the bread. The scripture reminds us, do not take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Examine yourselves. Confess your sin before your Lord and Savior. Have the the courage to let him expose anything in your heart that the Spirit would, would long to and confess that to him. Be set free. Be set free. That's the beauty of the gospel. Is your father and king looks right at your sin, calls it what it is, but offers you freedom on the other side. So as you hold the bread, remember his body. I'm going to give you just a few moments for you to do business with the Lord. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread. And after a blessing, he he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body. Now I want you to prepare the cup. Remembering that the cup symbolizes his blood that was shed for you. But it also symbolizes the freedom and the joy on the other side. It's the, it's the joy on the other side. It's a cup of celebration. The prisoner has been set free. By faith in Jesus Christ, the prisoner has been set free. So I'm going to give you just a few moments, and I want you to meditate on that. I want you to sing hallelujah, and I want you to praise your Savior as you think, and then we'll participate together, right? But you go in with a heart of celebration that you have been set free. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness 
of sins. Would you pray with me? Thank you, King Jesus. Thank you for setting us free. Thank you for taking our debt, our sin, all of it, taking it upon yourself as it was nailed to the cross in your body. You took the punishment that we deserve. And we praise you for that. We praise you because we get the freedom on the other side. And we rejoice and we celebrate knowing that we walk free and that we know you and that your spirit indwells us. And you, as a loving God and Father, love to pour out your grace upon grace upon grace in our lives. And you have promised to use everything for our good. Every trial and tribulation is for our good. And into eternity, eye has not seen and no heart has ever imagined what God has in store for those of us whom you love. Thank you, King Jesus. Thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Church family, as the praise team comes to lead us in a final song, this song is a chance for you to respond. Right? You, you have to sit silent and listen and pay attention and take notes and nudge your neighbor so they're not going to sleep and all that stuff, right? But but in the end, right, now we get to, you get to sing back to God in celebration, in faith. You get to stand in that freedom. You get to shout hallelujah. If you need someone to pray with this morning, we'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. You could have come in with something heavy, Listen to me, we are a family. We're not here to play church. We are a family, okay? Come, let, let someone carry that burden with you. If as we've walked through this service and, and this call to grace, this, this call to life has rung new in your heart, in your mind, in, in a way that, that you need to talk to someone, you need to make sure that you understand, all right? Jesus, as Lord and Savior, come, find life. Find life. You can do that right now. So whatever decision that the Spirit of God has pressed upon your heart, would you be obedient? Would you be obedient? And would you stand and would you sing in faith with everything in you? Mm -hmm.